All right, well, welcome to today's event on clean energy permitting. The context for today's event, of course, is that the United States has just authorized almost $400 billion in new clean energy spending. That's about almost $3,000 per American household. So it's a tremendous amount of money, but the key challenge is can we build some of this new clean energy infrastructure to provide us with a cleaner energy system that maintains the reliability and security that we've come to expect. So I'm very fortunate to be here with two experts in energy permitting. We have both uh, Professor Rob Glicksman, who uh, literally wrote the book on the National Environmental Policy Act, Law and Litigation, which is the princi principal statute that governs environmental review of, uh, of federal permits, um, and who has also written uh, a huge number of important pieces, both empirical and analytical, on how litigation works in the uh, federal permitting system and the consideration of uh, environmental factors in approving new infrastructure projects. Uh, I'm also very fortunate to be here with uh, Dr. Patnaik from uh, Brookings, who has uh, just released an incredibly timely and useful paper that discusses the clean energy infrastructure permitting challenges. In other words, if you're going to build a new solar farm, if you're going to build a new power line to bring solar power to market, if you're going to uh, build a new carbon dioxide pipeline for sequestration, any of these challenges, what are the federal, state, and local permits that you require? So I'd like to begin today's uh, discussion by just talking a little bit about why we're all of a sudden talking so much about permitting given this new infusion of cash uh, to, the, to the industry. So, uh, you know, obviously the aim of this spending, which is part of the Inflation Reduction Act, is uh, to do two big things. One is to take big and vital parts of our civilization, really, such as transport and heating, and transform them into reliance on electricity rather than reliance on fuels that you burn. And then a big secondary part of it is to take the electricity system and clean it up as well so that that electricity comes from cleaner sources, uh, principally uh, renewables like solar and wind, but also natural gas backing those renewables as well as uh, you know, natural gas that is paired with carbon sequestration. So taking that carbon dioxide uh, away so that it can be uh, stored permanently so it doesn't have the same impacts on global warming. Now, the, uh, the big challenge is that, and really a central irony of the energy system, is that these cleaner energy sources, such as renewable electricity, such as natural gas, are much harder to transport and store than the traditional energy sources that we've relied upon. So coal and oil, you know, much dirtier sources, but because they're easy to transport and store, that in some ways makes it easier to rely on those sources to be available. So you can think about if there's a shortage of coal or oil anywhere in the world, places that have abundant coal and oil can easily ship it to meet that shortage and take advantage of the higher prices created by that shortage. So they can ship it by rail, they can ship it by water, they can ship it by road, or using the, you know, in the case of oil, the extensive existing system of oil pipelines to bring it to market. By contrast, if you look at natural gas, if you look at electricity, in both of those cases, if there's a shortage somewhere, it is there's simply no short-term way to direct new supplies to, that, uh, to the area that's experiencing a shortage. Uh, and if you wanted to do that, typically it's going to take many years to get approval to build a new pipeline or power line, and that pipeline or power line is going to cost billions to build. And so that means that we're more subject to shortages and price swings in those markets. Another reason for that is because of the uh, challenges of storing those commodities. So, uh, you know, as an example, oil, there's been a lot of discussion of the strategic 
Petroleum Reserve in the United States. That stores about 40 days of U.S. consumption of oil. I think maybe what people don't know is that there's also big private stores of oil. So there are basically twice as much oil stored privately. So actually for all of 2021, for that entire year, we were short 2 million barrels per day of oil every day in terms of how much was being produced and how much we were consuming. We were consuming 100 million barrels per day and only producing 98 million. But we last, and that was before Strategic Petroleum Reserve release, we got through that entire year based on those private stores of oil, drawing those down. Now think about the contrast with, uh, and that allows us of course to smooth out prices, prepare for the future, is that if there's you know, a temporary shortage in oil, we can live off those stores. Natural gas, we don't have nearly as much storage. So with natural gas, we basically have about 40 days of stores, principally in private reserves. Uh, and then for electricity, the story unfortunately is even worse, which is currently in terms of energy storage, we have only, uh, for electricity storage, we really have only seconds of storage, less than a minute. I mean, so think about um, how difficult that makes it to balance the electricity system. And in fact, you know, one of the principal reasons for the big blackouts we had in Texas was we had, we had just four minutes of a lack of balance between how much power was being produced and how much was being demanded. That caused a frequency disruption on the grid that caused a chain reaction that you know, lasted uh, four days. So think about the contrast between the oil system, able to go basically a year, 2% short of oil versus the electricity system where if there's even a momentary disruption in balance, we're in serious trouble. So. How do we meet this challenge? How do we, you know, we're definitely building lots of new cleaner energy sources. Uh, these technologies are coming down in price. We would like to clean up our energy system. How can we build a system based on these cleaner energy technologies that has the reliability and security that we've come to depend on in the traditional energy sources like oil and coal? And the reality is basically it means a lot of new infrastructure. I mean, building a huge amount of uh, Trans electric transmission to bring power from where it's abundant. You could think about you know, those plain states where they have abundant wind energy. You can think about areas with abundant uh, solar energy to where it's needed. A huge amount of battery and electricity storage which can take a lot of different forms, some of which are geographically dependent. So again, depend on uh, transmission. A huge amount of uh, carbon dioxide pipelines to, to capture the carbon from you know, natural gas or coal facilities and, uh, and bury it, sequester it, so that uh, it doesn't, so to reduce carbon emissions. Uh, there's also, of course, a lot of focus on building new hydrogen pipelines mm -hmm. to help bring, um, to use hydrogen as an alternative to other, other fuels um, or for fuel cell technology or as an opportunity to store renewable energy when we have more of it. So all of these steps are gonna require a lot more infrastructure. Uh, and the question is, how do we build that infrastructure? Because at the same time that we have this desperate need for new infrastructure and we have a boom in these cleaner sources such as natural gas, such as renewable energy that are particularly dependent on new infrastructure, we've had some steps at both the federal and state level that are making it harder to build new infrastructure. And so that's why you started to hear a lot about permitting reform in Washington, D.C. Of course, Senator Manchin had a bill that he put out and then uh, withdrew. There are, seem to be negotiations ongoing on uh, whether some version of that bill, a modified bill, et cetera, could pass uh, either in the lame duck Congress or later. Uh, and so uh, that has made this a great moment to discuss this challenge of building new clean energy infrastructure whether reform is necessary, how Senator Manchin's proposal would, it, would or would not address these problems, and what the President and Congress can do to help us build a cleaner, but also continuing to be secure and reliable energy system. So with that, um, I, I'm just gonna ask you first, basic question, do you, do you agree that there is something with that Congress, the President need to take action on 
speeding up permitting for a clean energy infrastructure, and if so, why? And I'm going to start uh, with Dr. Patnaik because he just wrote a, this, uh, this great article that really lays out sort of the, um, the nuts and bolts of permitting for a number of these new clean energy projects. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. And um, I couldn't agree more. I think the problem what people forget always is when you try to decarbonize the economy, as you correctly said, we will need a lot of that infrastructure. And the problem is currently it just takes too much time to build that infrastructure. And that's not only a problem in the United States, but also in Europe. The Europeans realize that and they've started reforming their permitting system, uh, especially Germany when we look at the, at the problem with natural gas now. They've tried to cut down the time to build LNG terminals, which are for liquefied natural gas, from years to months because they need it. And the same thing has to happen in the United States if we really, really want to realize the full potential of the Inflation Reduction Act. A lot of that money cannot go anywhere if we don't put in the permits in place to actually build the infrastructure. And that, as you said, it includes transmission lines, which is really a big problem. Because when we look at transmission lines right now, um, there's some data out from the federal permitting dashboard. The median time to build a transmission line is seven years. For a natural gas pipeline is three years. And that's just really not feasible for an investor, right? It's a lot of time, there's a lot of uncertainty in it, and it doesn't provide investors, the people that actually build those uh, infrastructure projects uh, with the certainty they need. And so we, we need to reform them, we need to make it quicker. Okay, and let me highlight something about that, which I think is interesting, and maybe people don't always understand. You know, there's really two big aspects to this problem of permitting for clean energy. So one, is about uh, state and local roadblocks to clean energy, which was the subject of the paper that was you know, linked, uh, linked today. And there, there is a challenge which we, and this is maybe a little bit more longstanding uh, issue of energy policy within the US system, which is that you know, sometimes just as a neighbor might not want a power line going through his or her backyard, no matter how much that power line was needed. Sometimes when you need to build an interstate project that crosses several states, one of those states is gonna say, you know what, I'd rather not have it. And you know, in the context of, a, a, of electricity transmission, particularly for renewable energy, often you hear this rhetoric about, I don't wanna be the power cord for your state. So you know, there were efforts in um, you know, uh, Maine and New Hampshire have rejected uh, power lines that were designed to bring uh, hydroelectricity down to Massachusetts. You had uh, Missouri and Arkansas rejecting proposals to bring electricity across those states to uh, those from the west to the east, bringing wind energy. Uh, you've actually had a couple states recently say that you know that, of course, you all have a constitutional right that your land won't be taken except by the government, except for public use. And we've had a couple states, uh, both uh, Kentucky and West Virginia, say, well, it's not really for public use if you're sending it to people in other states. I guess they don't count as the public. So, so, there, are, uh, so there are a number of those kind of state and local roadblocks to transport over across multiple states, which is becoming more necessary with renewable energy. One of the reasons for this is, you know, historically the power grid kind of grew up organically from cities and area load centers and kind of met, you know, at, at those uh, utility boundaries. But now we have the case where we're having renewable energy produced in certain regions of the country and transported long distances. And so that makes that long distance interstate transport uh, more important. At the same time, so there's that state and local problem, there's also growing problems with getting that federal permitting infrastructure, as you suggested. You know, what are the timelines to get the federal permit that you need uh, for this process? And I think you know, some people view both of those problems as growing. I'm interested, Professor Glicksman, I mean, do you, do you view those as growing problems? Do you, do you, think, um, do you think there's a need for reform? Um, I'm just curious for your reaction to all of those. Okay, comments. so let me answer your, your last question and the question you asked a few minutes ago. Am I in favor of streamlining? Do I see a need for reform? And I'm going to give you a typical law professor's answer, yes and no. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to distinguish here between electricity transmission and natural gas pipeline construction. My answer is yes with respect to electricity transmission and no with respect to natural gas pipelines. So one key difference between the two derives from the statutes that give 
the federal government authority to regulate or manage activities involving um, the construction of uh, electric transmission lines and construction and operation of natural gas pipelines. Under the Federal Power Act, the federal government, operating through the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, has the authority to set rates for the transmission of electric energy interstate and for the sale for resale of electric um, energy interstate. But it doesn't have authority to control siting of electric tra transmission facilities. That's left to the states. And so as, as Professor Coleman said, the states kind of have a veto power over um, efforts to construct interstate electric transmission lines. And if you want to have a transmission line running through Massachusetts that comes from Ontario and is going to provide uh, electric power to Rhode Island or Connecticut or New York, Massachusetts might just say, no, we don't, we're not going to benefit from this, and so we're not going to give our approval. The situation is different under the Natural Gas Act, which is the federal statute that governs um, natural gas-related activity. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has greater authority over siting of natural gas pipelines than it does over electric transmission lines. And so the state veto power is weaker with respect to pipelines than it is with respect to natural gas uh, and then respect to electric transmission lines. So I think the, the problem you've identified is, is, is simply orders of magnitude greater for electric transmission lines than it is for natural gas pipelines. So that's one basis for, in my mind, distinguishing between the two. And um, I, I saw a figure that in the last 10 years, 230 natural gas pipeline projects have been completed in this country. So I don't think there's an insurmountable barrier to the construction and completion of these projects. It's happening, uh, and it has been happening. Um, the second ground for my distinguishing between the two is that the long-term goal here is not only <coughs> energy security and reliability, but decarbonization, again, as Professor Coleman said. And I think we're much more likely to get there if we focus on renewable sources of energy, creating electricity that can then be transmitted to areas of need, than we are relying on natural gas. Now, you know, it's often said that natural gas is a bridge source of energy, and it certainly has the potential to be cleaner than coal. But my concern is that these are likely to be multi-billion dollar projects, and once they're invested in and completed, the people who invested in those facilities are going to use them for the entire lifetime of the project, which could be 50 or 60 years. So facilitating the, the construction of new natural gas pipelines creates a kind of path dependency, um, which I think in, in the short and long term could discourage the uh, construction of competing uh, electricity uh, projects that, that rely on renewable energy. And so we're kind of locking ourselves into natural gas for a longer time than, it, than I think is advisable. And the third, the third qualm I have about natural gas pipelines is that they're susceptible to leakage, and in particular methane gas leakage. Methane is something like 20 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And the figure I saw is that if there's even 2% leakage of methane gas from natural gas pipelines and related facilities, they're actually dirtier than coal as a source of electricity. And so I would be much more sanguine about um, the construction of new natural gas infrastructure if I were confident that we had a government and a private sector who were determined to stop leakage of methane gas from pipeline facilities. And based on what I've seen, including the use of the Congressional Review Act by Congress in 2070 to overturn EPA regulations that would have required exactly that kind of control, I'm, I'm a bit troubled. Well, let me say, let me kind of address those two things uh, in reverse order, which is to say, I mean, I think one thing that you would be encouraged about is the methane fee in the yes. Inflation Reduction Act. So the Inflation Reduction Act uh, does include very substantial uh, methane fee designed to limit those methane emissions. I, you know, I can tell you, you know, 
and and the role of natural gas in the future of the energy system, you know, the reality is it's a fool's game to project where the energy system is going. But but you know, some of the you know the counter arguments that that you would hear is one, you know, currently in the world the biggest source of electricity is still coal. Right. And so if those methane emissions are under control, and that's, you know, we have studies from the uh, U.S. Department of Energy uh, labs basically saying that U.S. liquefied natural gas is going to reduce global carbon emissions if it replaces those coal, which still is the biggest source of electricity worldwide. I think, you know, the other thing that is a challenge is natural gas, there's no doubt that if it is flared at the well, or if it is leaked, it is purely an environmental negative because it's just, it's just a greenhouse gas emitted to the atmosphere. On the other hand, if it's brought to places where it is used to replace coal, coal I think most people view it in most life cycle analyses. You know, I've done some of these, but there's a lot of them out there, and you know, there's debate in that field like every other one. But most would say that's a big environmental benefit, not just for carbon, but for air quality, because you, one of the biggest impact of coal-fired power is not just its carbon emissions, but is the effect on air pollution, you know, particularly uh, in, developing, uh, in developing nations. So I do think that U.S. natural gas has a huge role to play in that. Already, you, we've seen that U.S. liquefied natural gas exports, which is where they take that natural gas, cool it most of the way down to absolute zero until it becomes a liquid and 400 times smaller, put it on a quarter billion dollar refrigerated vessel and send it overseas. The U.S. has gone from no exports in 2016 to the world's number one exporter. And that required investments in a huge number of $30 billion facilities, mostly on the U.S. Gulf Coast. So I do think there, you know, that, um, that potentially has a positive role to play in two challenges that we've talked about. One is moving towards cleaner energy systems because of its ability to replace coal. And the second is in terms terms of making that natural gas system more liquid and reliable. Because the great thing about liquefied natural gas, unlike a natural gas pipeline, unlike a power line, is it can be sent wherever there's a shortage currently. And so it's already playing that role in the markets. You can see that in when Russia cut off gas supplies to Europe and electricity and natural gas prices spiked to catastrophic lem levels, U.S. liquefied natural gas filled that gap. So it quickly overtook Russia's supply as the number one source of supply. So I think it has a good you know, role to play both on the economic and environmental side, but, there, but it's important that you understand that there's this continuing debate about you know, how much of that is undercut uh, by, methane, uh, by methane emissions, et cetera. I just, oh, would you, would you yeah, please, yes. Just to build on that, I, I actually agree with you. I think what people oftentimes forget is if you try to cut supply, you can't cut demand overnight, right? You, have st you still have the demand for natural gas and for fossil fuels in many parts of the world. I'll give an example, right? There's a pipeline project to Massachusetts that would bring natural gas to Massachusetts. It has been held up in New York State. And what is happening now that Massachusetts still needs the gas and to generate electricity, what they're doing is they're importing LNG, which is much more expensive and inefficient, and they are running some of their power plants with oil and coal, which is even worse. And so I, I believe in natural gas as a, as a transition fuel. I think it's very important if we address the leakage issue, and I think the methane fee is a very good first step because of the fact that we cannot just turn off demand overnight. And, and you brought up Europe. If we look at Germany, it's a perfect example, right? Mm -hmm. The Russians basically turned off gas overnight, but a lot of times natural gas is not only being used for electricity, but for industrial processes where you need very, like, a lot of heat, uh, and, and that cannot be changed overnight. Uh, you, you can't electrify that so quickly, and so you will need the natural gas, at least, I would say, for the next 30 to 40 years. And then the question is, where will it come from? It has to come from somewhere. If the U.S. has natural gas, it's probably better it comes from the U.S. than from countries like Saudi Arabia, uh, making other countries dependent on them. And, and I do agree, I think natural gas has played a really big role in replacing old coal-fired power plants in the U.S. We've mm -hmm. saw that already. Mm -hmm. The reason why coal collapsed in the U.S. is because of fracking and because of the natural gas switch. And we have a lot of potential in other countries to follow suit, again, under the condition that we address the leakage, which I agree with you. It's a big problem. Uh, but if we look at um, the uh, recent uh, climate conference, there was a big pledge by many countries to address methane. And that was a big surprise during the negotiations. Mm -hmm. So governments are aware of it, and I think they're taking more measures to clamp down on that. 
Uh, and let me, um, let me ask a, another question to both of you by underlining something that Professor Klixman noted, which is, it is very interesting the different permitting regimes that apply to different kinds of energy projects in the United States. And for a, a long time, the sort of conventional wisdom has been that natural gas pipelines have had things easier uh, because they are subject to federal review. Whereas, by contrast, oil pipelines and power lines are both subject to state-by-state -state review. And so they're more subject to that state-by-state -state holdup problem. Now, one interesting thing about that is that, um, and I, I think that's led to something that Professor Glicksman said, is this probably the most commonly proposed reform of the US energy system, I know I've proposed it, many, many of my colleagues have proposed it, is that electricity would be put on the same federal permitting um, plan that natural gas is. And the idea of that is, well, that maybe that will speed up permitting like we have for natural gas. And you know, Professor Glicksman noted the success of that there had been you know, big build out in natural gas pipelines. Now, one question I have about that going forward is, is it still easier to get something permitted just because you have a federal process. I agree, it definitely was in the past. That's why I and many other people proposed making electricity transmission easier by moving to a federal system. But I think you know one thing that I've heard from the natural gas industry, and it's hard to argue with, is that recently it's gotten much, much harder to get natural gas pipelines, even if they get their federal permits. Because the problems they're running into, one was, uh, was highlighted, which is that the Constitution pipeline, which was supposed to cross, was supposed to go to Massachusetts, cross New York, and New York, used what, uh, it had found a way to veto that project, basically, which is that um, under, um, the FERC is not allowed to give a permit for construction if the states won't give them a 401, Clean Water Act Section 401, water quality certification, and New York basically withheld that. Now, there are some exceptions where if the state waived its authority by not acting quickly enough, um, FERC can move forward. But that has been, um, because states retain the possibility of denying those projects, states have basically been able to veto federally approved projects. And if you look at the two most recent very high profile natural gas projects, which is you know, the Penn East gas pipeline and the Atlantic Coast pipeline, both of those projects always got all the federal permits they needed. In fact, they defended those permits successfully against court challenges all the way up to the Supreme Court and won in both cases. But because they were facing so many different veto risks, litigation challenges, et cetera, they eventually gave up on those projects. And so I guess one thing that I've heard, um, so one thing I hear from the natural gas industry is, you know, maybe it used to be that federal permitting was a good way to make things faster, but it isn't anymore. Even, even if you have federal permitting, states can find a way to veto <clears throat> your project. And I hear that from the power line industry as well, that, okay, you know, being put into federal permitting, which was one of, uh, which is something that was kind of done by the, uh, the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill and was a <clears throat> little bit, uh, was part of the Senator Manchin's bill to some extent as well, there was sort of more federal authority to prove interstate transmission. What I hear from a lot of you know, power line companies is we're concerned that we, that's not gonna be enough to actually get our project built because we may face the same veto points that natural gas pipelines are facing to try to get built. So I wonder, you know, for both of you, do you think having federal permitting is still a benefit that would get things moving faster? Or is it only a benefit if we can do something else to speed up the federal permitting process? I can start with this one. So there are really uh, two sets of, of issues here, one of which you mentioned, the other of which we can probably get to later. The one we can get to later is triggering the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, mm -hmm. reviews, which applies to federal agencies, but not state agencies, unless they're acting in conjunction with or being funded by the federal government. The second is the Section 401 certification process, um, which is a provision of the Clean Air Act that basically says if a project needs a federal permit 
license or registration, and the operation of the project may lead to a discharge of water into surface waters, the state must certify that the project will comply with state environmental regulations in order for the federal agency to be able to, to issue that license or permit. And I think what you talked about, Professor Coleman, uh, in terms of a state saying, well, we, we don't want this in our areas, is an example of a long-running phenomenon in environmental law, which is the not in my backyard um, phenomenon, the NIMBY syndrome, where <coughs> there's a project that will provide a social good, but a particular jurisdiction doesn't want to see it in its backyard because it will benefit from the project even if it's located elsewhere and it won't have to bear the burdens of environmental contamination that might result from the project. And uh, a desire to combat the NIMBY syndrome has, has long been a justification for greater federal regulation of a particular activity. And I think there's some merit to, to giving the federal government more authority to override those kinds of state objections here. The way the statute is written now and has been interpreted by courts, including the Supreme Court, states have pretty broad authority to impose whatever conditions they want on their certifications under Section 401, even if they don't have anything to do, really, with preservation of water quality. I would not be opposed, I don't think, to narrowing the scope of that authority to condition uh, so that, for example, a state couldn't veto a natural gas pipeline because it would contribute to climate change. That's a global, indeed, it's a, it's a national and international problem, not a local or state problem. And so I, I see the justification for having federal preemption of state authority to object on that ground to be, be well, well grounded. I'd be a little bit more concerned about uh, precluding states from objecting on any other local environmental uh, adverse effects like toxic air pollutants or groundwater contamination. I think I'd like to preserve state authority um, to exercise that authority, subject judicial review, to make sure that the state isn't doing so on pretextual grounds. Mm. So that, that's interesting because you know, currently it's that's the main review. So if you're if you're a natural gas company and the uh, state denies you your water quality certification, you go to the court for review. And so um, one proposal has been to go to FERC for review. Uh, and do you, would you favor that? Are you comfortable with that? Or is that something you would oppose? I would favor it if FERC had the first crack at it, but that FERC's decision were subject to review mm. as well. Mm. Now, I would expect courts would defer to FERC as, as having some expertise in the area, but I wouldn't want to eliminate all, all judicial oversight. Yeah. So, and FERC, of course, is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission <laughs> that uh, considers those questions under the Natural Gas Act. Okay, um, and so yeah, I'm curious. Do you think do you think federal review is still a benefit, you know, as opposed to state review for these projects? I mean, that is. We're going to talk a little bit more about Senator Manchin's bill in a second and what that does. Uh, but one big part of Senator Manchin's bill was for expanding the circumstances where effectively you would have federal review for an interstate power line project, as well as uh, for uh, hydrogen pipelines. So for those two projects, I think the idea was, let's make it easier to build them by subjecting them to federal review rather than state review. And what I wonder is, is that a benefit? Would you rather have federal review than state review? And what I've heard is that there's some ambivalence in the, about this in among industry, but I, I'm curious if you've heard otherwise or just looking at I mean, you really laid out all the permitting requirements. You know, does it seem like that's, that's a benefit from the perspective of you know, clean industry? I think it could streamline the process a bit more. I mm -hmm. agree. Because states are just so divergent in their preferences. Mm -hmm. So if you centralize it at the federal level, you can at least override some of those. Mm -hmm. I think where there's another veto point that is very important is at the very local level. And so oftentimes, uh, uh, very local permits, you have veto points where some of the very small communities can kind of like put up roadblocks mm -hmm. or litigation. Mm -hmm. And I think there are ways at the state level to try to kind of like override that or mitigate that. And we see some initiatives on that, for instance, in, in housing zoning and things like that in other mm -hmm. states. So I think that's another key point. Yeah, it's an, 
I'm sorry. No, please. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, I do think that, you know, this, this is a huge problem because it is kind of like the NIMBY problem, but the problem is that these are sovereign actors. And so in some ways, you know, it, we have eminent domain to deal with individual NIMBY landowners. And with respect to states, it's much harder to exercise that um, you know, an equivalent of eminent domain because you're dealing with state sovereignty. And that can be a potential issue, especially because, remember, all these states have elections. So it's like if you have your permit, if you've got five states you need a permit from, and you're sweating out every election, if one election in any of those five states goes against you, all of a sudden your project is dead. It can be, yeah. uh, you know, it can certainly... Uh, be nerve wracking. Okay, another. Can I just add? A yeah, please. So, please. so an, an obvious benefit to federal review is that you'd have one reviewer instead yeah. of a multi state yeah. transmission line or pipeline that goes through five or six states and you have to run the gauntlet of, of each of those. The other thing I would say with respect to uh, application of anti nimbyism to states is that it, it's been tried before. The, the Low Level Radioactive Waste Policy Act of 1980 was adopted because there were only three states in the country that had operational low-level radioactive waste disposal facilities. And Congress felt this is unfair that the other 47 states are sending their waste to these three facilities. And the reason nobody else wanted to have a facility is who wants a radioactive waste disposal site in, in their backyard? So Congress basically uh, decided that every state had to, to do something to participate in the process of building new facilities. And the Supreme Court by and large, I've held that mm -hmm. as a valid exercise of federal power. So it can be done if it's done carefully. I'm curious, uh, you know, you raised this question about distinguishing between natural gas pipelines and power lines. Uh, but that seems to be because you believe power lines are, and, this, and, I, and I would have agreed with you for sure five years ago, and this was certainly the conventional wisdom for a long time, power lines are treated more poorly, they have a more difficult time with the regulatory process than natural gas pipelines. I wonder if given that, you would be okay with actually having a very similar or even the same review process for, the, for all of these different sources, for power lines, for natural gas pipelines, for hydrogen pipelines, for carbon dioxide pipelines. You, do you think it would make sense to put them all under a unified process? I mean, you know, that's the kind of legislation that I wouldn't want to write. It would be big, very challenging. But, but I, I wonder what you think about that proposal. Yeah, I, I've never thought about that question. So my off-the-cuff answer is yes, I think that's probably a good idea. Um, my impression not being as up to speed on energy-related issues as I am on environmental issues is that the difference between the... Um, Federal Power Act and Natural <clears throat> Gas Act are largely historic rather than based on logic or, or uh, real-world problems. And so if that's the case, sure, it seems to me a unified, uniform process that governs all sources of energy would, would be a step in the right direction. And it sounds like you, you probably agree with that. Totally. Yeah. Okay, well, we got, well, now we've got to solve that. <laughs> we can end early. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> uh, okay, great. Well, um, so let's move, let's move on from the you know, general problem and talk a little bit about the proposal that's been out there since the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, which is that Senator Manchin put out a you know, one-page sort of proposal, call it a white paper, but it's just a page, uh, and then followed it up with some legislative text we've seen, although there was a lot of different versions of legislative text floating around it. Uh, at different times. Now, uh, I, I'd love for you all to correct me on this if I, if I miss key, key portions of this. But basically, uh, it seemed that the uh, proposal was, one, as I mentioned, to federalize review of hydrogen pipelines and of uh, certain power line projects declared to be in the national interest. Uh, that and then there was uh, some steps taken that notionally would speed up national environmental policy re reviews, those federal environmental reviews, uh, that were basically, the suggestion was that there would be deadlines imposed on those federal government reviews that unless they had good cause, they would have to do a environmental impact statement. That's kind of the gold standard review for projects that are uh, found to have significant environmental impacts, that those would be done within two years maximum, and that for environmental assessments, 
Uh, those are projects that are ultimately found not to have uh, significant environmental impacts, that those would be done within one year and that the agency could ask for extensions uh, if need be. So the uh, intent of that, I think, was to speed up that federal, uh, that federal permitting process. So that was another, that was another uh, component of the, this proposal. Um, and then there was a lot of sort of shuffling, you know, there, there was sort of just some gentle jostling or shuffling of the 401 uh, provision in a way that I think ultimately seemed to please no one very, very much. But it was, you know, in some respects, they were expanding review. In some respects, they were narrowing review. But it, it didn't. Um, it didn't make any big changes to that Section 401 authority, which gives, has in practice often given states a veto over federally approved, uh, approved projects. Finally, there was one provision that, uh, a little bit hard to explain, I think, well, there, there's, there were a couple provisions that seemed to be solely related to the Mountain Valley Pipeline, which is you know, a specific you know, natural gas pipeline across crosses Virginia, um, and that, Pipeline, which Senator Manchin has supported, uh, the provision was to you know have the administration effectively promise to expedite all permits necessary to build it and to have those decisions not subject to judicial review. And I think so. I think many people looked at you know whatever effect the rest of this bill would have. One effect would be to actually get the Mountain Valley pipeline built. And then there was another provision that said the uh, that purported to randomize the panels. So circuit courts have a number of judges on it, far more than needs to hear any individual case. And so typically three judges are chosen at random to hear that case unless it's related to a case that they've previously considered, in which case you'll have the same three judges if you can. Um, and this purported to randomize that is a little bit unclear whether they want it more random or just the same amount random. I think the, re the reason for that was likely that the Mountain Valley Pipeline was unhappy with the panel it received uh, to, uh, in some of the litigation that it had. So anyway, that's the basics of uh, Senator Manchin's bill. Any supplements to that? Any other provisions you thought were particularly important? And then just your reaction to that bill, whether you think it, you know, how much it would do, if it's helpful, if there's parts that are unhelpful, et cetera. I think, I mean, it's very interesting when you look at how the bill ended up, mm -hmm. that it was attacked from both the left and the right. Mm -hmm. um, th that's not an, an alliance we see too many times. Mm -hmm. I think it has some um, important elements to it. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, applying the FERC process to transmission lines. I think that was critical there. The Mountain Valley Pipeline is, I think, is a very good example of rent seeking, <laughs> where you have one, uh, one senator trying to kind of like get a pet project forward. And probably if he hadn't included that, he might have got more support, I would imagine. Um, so I think it's a good start. Uh, I think, we, as we had mentioned earlier, we need some kind of reform, and it has some elements in there that would at least, I think, at the federal level, try to speed things up. But it definitely has to be refined further, I think and probably some pieces taken out that are too specific. Okay, great. I, I agree with uh, most of what, what you've just said. Um, I, I think that with respect to the Mountain Valley Pipeline, um, it's gotten uh, remanded back to the agencies twice by the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals for environmental reasons. I think one was a Section 401 Clean Water Act certification. The other one might have been Endangered Species Act issue. And my impression is that there's been an oral argument in a third case, and it's likely the Fourth Circuit will send it back yet again. So my impression is if it can't pass muster on environmental grounds, we have no business forcing it to be completed. And so I, I oppose uh, the provisions in the, in the bill that would basically uh, green light this without regard to environmental effects. Um, I also agree with you about the, the desirability of, of sort of centralizing and federalizing the process of review of electric transmission lines. With respect to NEPA and the, the efforts you've described to accelerate that process, I'm really kind of of two minds about that. Um, the NEPA process has three possible pathways. One is the gold standard that, that, doc, that Professor Coleman talked about, which is uh, the full-blown environmental impact statement. The second is this environmental assessment, which is sometimes called a sort of a, a mini environmental impact statement. It's not as lengthy and it doesn't take as long, 
And then there's a third process called categorical exclusion, which basically says you don't really have to do any NEPA analysis at all. If you can prove that uh, this project is not likely to have any environmental effects, then you, you, know, you can just go ahead with it. And the Mansion Bill would encourage federal agencies to expand the use of categorical exclusions. I oppose that. I mean, by their very nature, these are important big projects. Uh, I think uh, the ones that are subject to this natural interest prioritization are that it must involve two or more federal agencies, a quarter of a billion dollars in cost. These are big projects. These are not the kind of projects that are appropriate for the application of categorical exclusions. It would basically cut out the NEPA process altogether. With respect to the, the deadlines, I'm not sure they would do much. It's possible that agencies could manipulate the triggering event that starts the clock running. I guess the clock starts running on the one or two years when the agency issues a notice of intent to go ahead with the project, and they can just delay when they issue that notice and, and, and prevent the clock from starting. Um, but, but even putting that aside, I, I think one needs to be careful about streamlining the NEPA process for two reasons. Number one, there's a study by uh, John Rupel and Heather Tanana of Utah, which basically says that the empirical um, information indicates that some of these large infrastructure projects are not really being delayed by NEPA. That's really not the culprit. The culprit is the kind of state permitting review that we've talked about already. And so um, you may be directing your ammunition at something that's really not, not a problem. Um, they also found, however, that the shorter the time it takes to prepare, let's say, an environmental impact statement, the more likely it is to be challenged in court and reversed by a court. And so speed can lead to shortcuts, carelessness. And so in the long run, preparing an EIS quickly that gets knocked down by a court and sends the agent back to the drawing board can actually slow down the process rather than speeding it up. So I'm a little bit concerned about the deadlines. Yeah, so I, I think I uh, mostly agree with uh, what what each of you have said here. So let me let me start with um, Professor Glexman. So the uh, and and I should say that in addition to reading some of the papers by uh, John Rupel that he mentioned, you should read Professor Glexman's paper with uh, David Adelman at Texas, which goes into uh, you know very very carefully looks at the. What happens with particular NEPA cases? How what you know? What percentage are brought um, go to court? How often do the plaintiffs win? What agencies are challenged? So often, if I'm citing statistics about the National Environmental Policy Act, they're from uh, they're from that uh, that paper, which is which is really excellent. Um, so first of all, uh, my general impression of the bill is that uh, unfortunately it wouldn't do very much to speed up permitting. And let me explain the reasons for that. First, on the federal front, I agree with what uh, Professor Glicksman said about the, you know, telling the federal government it has a deadline is not necessarily gonna accomplish much. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is, there's really no way to enforce that <laughs> deadline. And you know, indeed, it doesn't even try to enforce it because there's a good cause exception. So basically, the federal government could get out of it anytime it wants to. In addition, even when the federal government wants to hit a deadline, right? It's under some congressional, congressional deadline to regulate a pollutant. It wants to regulate it. It very frequently, if not almost always, misses those deadlines. So I don't think, even if it wanted to hit those deadlines, it's not clear that it would. I do, um, you know, in the past, I myself have advocated deadlines. So I'm not sure they would do much harm, but I do actually take this point to be a good one, which is that they're possibly the biggest problem with NEPA for project proponents is the concern of being having your project enjoined by the courts, even though, um, as the statistics would show, that's not a majority result by any means. Um, it is still, uh, you know, when you're considering your expected value and some of the risks that you're subject to when making one of these projects, that's one of the really, frankly, kind of terrifying risks is that you may never be able to build this project that you put um, so much money and time into developing. And so if there is a risk that the 
a directive that the federal government speed up these reviews is going to lead to an inference with the courts that somehow these reviews are too rushed or that there wasn't a careful enough review, it really potentially uh, could be harmful. So um, I will say that, you know, I, although that's a, it's a great, uh, it's a great paper by uh, Professor Rupel at Utah, um, I, and Professor Tanana, I, I do worry a little bit about the conclusion that's being drawn, because although it's true that speeding up the National Environmental Policy Act reviews is likely not a sufficient condition to get projects built faster, I do think it's a necessary condition, right? Because you can't build until you have your permit, and so I think that we absolutely have to address the state uh, and um, we have to address both the state and the federal issues, the funding issues. There's a variety of potential things that are slowing projects down. Now, I also agree that federalizing the process is potentially quite helpful. The concern for me is one I mentioned earlier, which is that I'm, I'm concerned that under the current federal process, it's not actually clear it's that much faster for, uh, for projects because of some of the delays that have impacted federal permitting and because the demonstrated ability of the states to stop even projects that have those federal approvals for both states uh, and courts to stop those projects. So I, yeah, I'm not, I, I'm not particularly optimistic about it in its current form. You know, one thing I've suggested is that there be stronger steps taken to at some point you know, stop the ability of judicial review to stop a project that has had years of review, been approved by, you know, uh, one, you know one administration after another. Um, the, uh, you, the final thing I'll say is that, you know, this provision about, um, I, I don't favor, you know, exempting one, one project alone. I think, you know, these, the National Environmental Policy Act is a process law and it doesn't make sense to start exempting individual projects from uh, a general process. If there's a problem with the process, the process should be improved. It shouldn't be just a you know, one by one favored project uh, gets through. And I think the randomization <laughs> idea is a very, very bad idea because, and I born purely out of frustration with this one, uh, one panel in the Fourth Circuit because you know, if you think about, from a perspective of a project proponent, you don't wanna win one case you have to win every case. Because if you lose one case, your project will not be built. And so the more panels that you're subject to, if you have you know, more, if you have fewer related cases and your separate cases are treated by different panels, there's more of a chance that your project will go, won't go forward. So I think that in particular uh, is counterproductive. Um, Can I add, add yeah, one please. more thing that is raised by something you said about the, the timing of review? So the mentioned bill, uh, I think with respect to NEPA, I'm not sure with respect to other issues, would create a very short statute of limitations for bringing lawsuits. If you wanted to challenge one of these projects, you have to do it within 150 days of its approval. Current law is six years. So that's a long time, and it creates a great deal of uncertainty for um, investors and project proponents. 150 days, I think, is a bit quick. So I'd be in favor of reducing uh, the statute of limitations from six years, it may be down to a year rather than 150 days. Okay, so uh, you know the last question I wanted to end with, and before we go to, we're going to have Q and A. But before uh, before we go to Q and A, I'm just curious, what do you all think should be done that hasn't yet been done, either by Congress or by the President? Uh, you know, apart from what we've talked about in Senator Manchin's bill, to speed up permitting of you know these clean energy infrastructure projects. Please. Sure. I mean, I think one idea that they have worked on in Europe, which I found very interesting, is that you have pre-approved zones mm -hmm. where you say, okay, in this zone, if you build something, you don't need an environmental impact statement, or you don't need to go through the entire process. <coughs> so you can imagine, for instance, if you have an area somewhere in the desert, you do an uh, analysis before for the entire zone and say, look, there's very little impact on the environment. For the future, we designate that zone as potential siting for a solar project. So I think having kind of like these pre-designated zones ahead of time could really help with uh, building out some of the infrastructure in the future. Another small tweak is rather obscure, but uh, as you know, in the US we have the Jones Act that basically 
allows ships from one US port to the other US port only to be run by a US ship with US citizens and the US flag. Mm -hmm. Problem is that when you want to build an offshore wind farm, you need a specialized vehicle, a specialized ship, and the US doesn't have any of those ships. So what happens now is that you have to bring them in from other ports, from Canada, for instance, and so that drives up costs significantly. So I think, for instance, exam finding an exemption for that for European ships, because the Europeans have a lot of those ships, mm -hmm. could speed up offshore wind farm project building and also kind of like reduce the costs. Yeah, it's a big problem for liquefied natural gas as well. So as you said, Boston sometimes has to port, import liquefied natural gas. Right, There's yeah. plenty of liquefied natural gas in the U.S., but I think last time they imported it, they had to, uh, from, they had to normally get it from Trinidad and Tobago, but last time they needed extra, they had to skirt Russian sanctions to bring in a Russian liquefied natural gas because there's no American liquefied natural gas tankers that could bring it from the U.S. Gulf Coast. So, yeah. But I, I don't want to turn this into a Jones Act panel because right, we, <laughs> we, could, we could talk all, all day about that. So, yeah. So I, 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 I'm going to pick on something, you said, uh, uh, on something you said. I think it's a great idea, and that's the creation of these corridors. And, and we've actually seen something like that um, when the Bureau of Land Management tried to facilitate the development of solar projects on public lands during the Obama administration. It created these solar corridors uh, in which it would really kind of grease the wheels for uh, approval of these solar projects. And I, I think it worked pretty well. So uh, I think I'd be in favor of expanding that idea, certainly over different BLM lands and Forest Service lands so that those two agencies could provide uh, areas in which there'd be relatively little pushback on these projects. I'd have to think about whether I'm comfortable expanding it to, to private property, but certainly it's an idea that's worth thinking about. Um, I think maybe I would, in an executive order or maybe in, in uh, the organic statutes of the Bureau of Land Management and Forest Service, uh, make it a, a distinct priority to facilitate the, uh, the, the approval of these projects. And um, th those two agencies basically have broad discretion in choosing which uses to allow on the lands they manage. And I would kind of put a thumb on the scale in favor of, of using at least some portions of their lands for approval of these projects. And the other thing would be keep the flow of money coming. I mean, the, the Build Back Better bill, the infrastructure, the infrastructure bill, Inflation Reduction Act, provide a great deal of money to, to help these projects uh, come to fruition. And I, I would keep the, the pipeline open for that. All right, so uh, look forward to questions from the audience. J.P. Hogan, uh, you're speaking, and it sounds like you're speaking of the old school, a house needs 120 volts always, and you we're almost to 70% a household can run off 12 volts or 20 volts. So in, in trying to understand permits, we are close to the point where people could go to a store, an RV store or a boat store, and get a three-foot windmill, a small solar panel, or put something in their water line and generate enough low voltage. So it seems like going forward, if we'd have a separate low voltage system than the regular voltage system, and we don't have to transport the energy and have that type of infrastructure. So it's how would you calculate supply and demand if we're close to 70% no longer needs the high voltage. For... Yeah, so um, so let me say about, I, you know, and, and this really connects with the idea that um, maybe we can move towards a more distributed grid, particularly as some of the, you know, there, you know, in some ways, you know, solar plus batteries works very well for, um, you know, depending less on the high voltage system, et cetera. I mean, my experience, my sense of most consumers is there are some that are willing to micromanage their energy use and think about, do I have the batteries? Do I have the power, et cetera? But most are still like the idea that they never think about electricity. Their, their ideal, and it, it pains me as somebody who loves thinking about energy policy, but their ideal amount of thinking about energy policy is zero. And you know, one example I give of this, you know, what's the most, you know, one of the most uh, popular consumer electronics in recent years, right? It's those, you know, Alexa, those Google Homes, those sort of, what is the advantage of that device? Because all of our phones can do exactly what that can do. 
The only advantage of that is that it is constantly plugged in and constantly uh, listening to you, so you never have to press a button, right? So that's how little <laughs> we like to think about our electricity use, which is effectively uh, zero at all. And so I think you know there's going to be more and more options available for people who um, are, uh, you know, and they'll be more affordable, they'll be more workable, but I think there's still going to be a large part of the population dependent on our uh, high voltage system, and I think uh, we're going to have to continue to find uh, ways to provide them with electricity they don't have to think about. And it's not only private households, it's a lot of industrial customers. Yeah. We can't forget about those, right? And the additional infrastructure, as you mentioned, that we might need for hydrogen, and for other potential uh, issues, so I don't think you can separate that out. Uh, thank you all so much for this um, fascinating panel. I have a question for the two law professors uh, on the panel. Um, Professor Coleman, one of the suggestions you've made in, I think, your congressional testimony was um, that one way to expedite a lot of the litigation aspects of it is that challenges to EISs can all go straight to a court of appeals instead of going to lower level courts first, mm -hmm. and potentially all go to the same court. Um, and I know that this is something sort of in parallel, an analogy I sometimes think about is um, a lot of business cases, for example, go to Delaware just because the courts there have the expertise to deal with these, these cases much more quickly and they can sort of um, decide them on the merits better. I have a question for both of you, whether you would sort of endorse something like that. Is there a particular circuit court um, that all EIS challenges should go to or would you favor it more that, you know, challenges to wind farms in Utah stay in, you know, the relevant district uh, appeals court there. So yeah, so yes, I, I mean, I, and, it, and it sounds to me like from something that Professor Glicksman said earlier, he might not support this. So I want to hear what he, I want to hear what he has to say. Um, so it's very common with challenges to environmental regulations that the challenge has to be, you know, to ensure timely resolution of that litigation that has to be brought within sixty days. And it has to be brought in the D.C. Circuit. Sometimes it can be brought in other uh, in other circuits. And so, and I think that kind of um, I think that would be a viable approach to uh, National Environmental Policy Act challenges as well. So I do favor that under the Natural Gas Act. You know, typically you get either the D.C. Circuit or one other choice. So they, so there's there um, there are different rules that you could have. I just think it might be good to skip the circuit court to resolve these faster. Now, one reason you might worry about that is if you feel that there are, you know, unrepresented plaintiffs uh, that are going to be subject to projects. And are you know, and may not realize that they need to challenge it right away, um, or that you know maybe the circuit court is too far or otherwise. I think environmental litigants are getting very sophisticated about finding people potentially impacted by projects, filing challenges right away because in fact they often you know typically you want to file the challenge before anything has been built because. If you don't, you may uh, the court may not enjoin construction, and that actually happened with the Dakota Access Pipeline. One of the challenges, the court just said, "Well, you brought it too late," and so um, so I so I'm not as worried about that. But from the comment about the about the statute of limitation, I, I think maybe Professor Glicksman is. So I'm curious. Yeah, well, I, I'm not crazy about the 60-day limit, but um, the, the rest of the question is is, is really interesting. So. There are provisions in our current environmental laws that do funnel all challenges to particular actions to one court, and that's the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. So the Clean Air Act, for example, says that if you want to challenge uh, a regulation of national applicability or other action taken by EPA of national applicability, the only place you can file that is in the DC Circuit. And that has some advantages, including the development of a body of expertise by the courts uh, by the judges in that court on Clean Air Act matters, um, rather than having a case sent to a judge in the Eighth Circuit who's never seen an environmental case in, in his or her or her life. Um, so the idea of, of centralizing these in one court ha has some appeal to me. Now, again, the, the, the Clean Air Act provision says it's got to be a, a project of nap national applicability. And if we're talking about one of the projects in the Mansion Bill that have been deemed of national importance or strategic national importance, maybe you meet that qualification. 
and, and sending it to the, the D.C. Circuit would be a good idea. Now, the question that occurs to me is why are some challenges directed to the district courts and others to the courts of appeals? And, and my impression is that the difference exists based on whether or not there's a perception that trial type, trial type fact finding is necessary uh, over and above what the agency has done. If so, the case goes to federal district court. If the case can be reviewed entirely on the basis of the administrative record developed by the agency, then it, it's more appropriate to send it to a court of appeals. So I'm not an environmental litigator. I've never been an environmental litigator. I don't know to what extent uh, NEPA challenges in federal district courts are subject to significant amplification of the administrative record developed by the agency preparing the EIS and responding to challenges to comments on the EIS. If the record is pretty comprehensive at the agency level, I'd be more in favor of sending it directly to a court of appeals. But if in practice it turns out that in a lot of cases <clears throat> these records need to be supplemented by fact finding by district court through discovery and otherwise, then I'd be a little bit more reluctant. And it's just, I don't, I don't have the information available that would allow me to make that judgment call. So can I just ask, uh, I think as our, as our last question for today, is, you know, are there any uh, either piece of research or piece of policy that you're really looking forward to that you're watching for? Close? I can tell you, for me, I'm very interested to see if there's a new version of this, uh, you know, Senator Manchin's bill um, and sort of how it uh, plays politically, right? Is it, is it something that brings in, uh, you know, more uh, more support on the Republican side is, or is it something that loses more Democrat votes, et cetera? I'm looking, uh, I'm interested in that question, but I wonder for, for both of you, if there's anything, you know, either a you know, new policy decision by the administration that you're looking for on clean energy infrastructure or a new uh, bill, or even just a new uh, piece of research that you're, you're kind of uh, interested to see the results of on these questions. So I think I'm interested in two things. One is how the Europeans are going for forward with their permitting reforms, especially like with the crunch of natural gas that they're facing. And the second one in the US is how the methane fee is gonna be implemented and supervised. Mm -hmm. I think that's gonna be very interesting and also monitored. Yeah, since I'm a NEPA expert, I'll talk about NEPA. <laughs> uh, and that is uh, the Trump administration revised the NEPA regulations that had been in effect basically unchanged since 1978. They were completely overhauled. Um, the Biden administration has already issued a set of targeted changes to the Trump NEPA regulations, but it says it's got a broader scale set of reforms under consideration. In fact, I read this week that they might completely toss out the Trump regulations. The Trump regulations are being litigated right now in several district courts. Uh, the challenges have been, I think, dismissed or, or delayed for lack of standing because there's a question about whether anybody is being immediately harmed. I have no doubt that the, the Biden revisions will be challenged as well. So I'm really interested to see how that plays out and what NEPA looks like two or three years from now. And even the possibility that Congress could decide to amend NEPA if they're not happy with the way the agency um, ultimately comes out on these things. All right, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your uh, being here and sharing your expertise with us.